Okay, so I hope you have a Bible with you on whatever form you have it. There are Bibles right in front of you as well. Uh, please turn to the book of Philippians where we're going to endeavor to look at part two of our series as we're talking about living as citizens of heaven. Now the truth is in all of our lives we share both momentous events, good things, and also in the journey of our life, in our story, there are twists and turns that we would not anticipate. There's both joys and sorrows. And we're, of course, grateful when we encounter good things. A friend who comes to visit you that you haven't seen for a while. Or, you know, you, you find someone's wallet on the side of the road. And by the way, if you find a wallet, it's probably mine because I lost it last week. <laughs> But bless the person who found that. Um, and we, we like that. But at times when things do not go as anticipated or desired, we bemoan, okay? we lament, we complain, and we're not as enthusiastic of those things. So again, our title of this series is Living as Citizens of Heaven. As we're reading the letter to the Philippians, hopefully through that lens. What about this verse? What about this passage? What about this chapter that helps me to understand how I am to live as a Christian, and we expanded that out, as a citizen of heaven? Most of us, if not all of us, are citizens of this country, and there's certain ways in which we are to interact as citizens here. We, as Christians, have a greater citizenship than an American citizenship, which is a good thing. We have a greater citizenship as, uh, as residents of heaven, and I want us to think about this. This place, this country, your current place where you live, is temporary, okay? You're here for a time. You may even be uh, in the same place for an entire lifetime, but in comparison to the eternal life and your eternal dwelling and your real home, this is nothing but a blink of an eye. And so as citizens of heaven, I'm asking us, the Holy Spirit is asking us, the scriptures is compelling us to think about our lives, not from the just um, temporal way of viewing our circumstance, but from a, and with a, eternal lens. And so Paul helps us to do that as he is reflecting and reporting upon his circumstances which were difficult and he uses a lens that I'm asking us to use as well as we reflect upon our um, circumstances and our situations so I want us to think about this as he understood as he processes as he proceeds through his own circumstances that we can then and reflect and report on our own in a way that is scripturally informed and heavenly minded. So there's just two points today, okay? And there's two paragraphs that we're going to look at and examine. And my hope is that it will impact you, okay? My hope is that God would again speak his word to you, that we would be open and then put these things into mind and into practice. So this is the first thing that I want us to focus on this morning. I'm asking you to pray your circumstances will serve to advance the gospel, okay? Now, often we don't think this way. Perhaps you are more heavenly-minded than I am. And so I am learning, and I'm asking us to learn, that our circumstances pray that God would use them. They would serve to advance the gospel. So this is our text, and we're going to unpack it a bit. So this is Philippians chapter 1. We're picking up again in verse 12. Okay, so here we are, Philippians 1, 12 through 14. Paul is saying, reporting back to the Philippians. Now, I want you to know, brothers and sisters, 
that what has happened to me has actually served to advance the gospel. As a result, it has become clear throughout the whole palace guard and to everyone else that I am in chains for Christ. And because of my chains, most of the brothers and sisters have become confident in the Lord and dare all the more to proclaim the gospel without fear. Okay, we're going to pause there. So on the surface, being in jail does not seem to be a desired nor hoped for circumstance. The Philippian Christians had certainly heard that this had happened to Paul. So much so that they sent this man, Epaphroditus, to Paul with a gift, with perhaps some food, with perhaps some money, with perhaps, obviously, their prayers to help alleviate this condition of him being chained in jail. They helped him with his needs. And they viewed Paul's circumstance as a setback to his mission. They sent him out, and Paul was going out to, like we sung about, proclaim his name to places in which had not yet heard. And now, instead of being about the countryside, or preaching in the synagogues, or explaining the gospel freely wherever he wanted to go, wherever the Spirit led him to go, he was now confined to one place in chains. And they're like, oh my word, I can't believe this happened to the Apostle Paul. We prayed for him and he's on fire for the Lord and he has a message that is certainly important. And now he's chained. And perhaps they're thinking, oh poor Paul, right? Perhaps they're thinking, Oh man, the message of the gospel no longer is going to go forward. And perhaps they're thinking, God, why have you allowed this to happen? Have you ever asked that question? God, why? Now, typically, we don't ask that question when we get a check, an unexpected check in the mail, right? (laughs) Why, God? Why? Why? (laughs) <laughs> right? Or <laughs> all the traffic parts, right? Like Moses in the Red Sea, we just go on through without impediment. We never ask God why then, right? But often it is, why did this accident happen? Why did this infirmity take place? Why did these people come against me, so on and so forth? And so the guess is that this congregation who was partnering with Paul, who were dedicated to the gospel, connected to Paul, were asking and feeling, oh man, this is not a real good thing here. So Paul, right here in verse 12, said, hey, 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 listen. Listen up to me, Paul said. He's writing back, and he sent this letter back with Epaphroditus and said, okay, tell them this, that, no, let me tell you actually what the truth is about my circumstance. What's happened to me actually served to advance the gospel. It has served the purpose of the gospel. You know that God is more concerned about getting his message out than his church is. He's concerned about it. You know why? Because you love people, but he loves people more. And so his desire is that his message of salvation, the message of Christ, the offer of eternal life reaches the hearts and minds of individuals. And so when we say yes to him, and my hope is that not only have you said yes to him for your personal salvation, that you say yes to him because of his global mission. Do you understand that, right? Salvation is for you. You've heard me say this before, but it's not about you. Ultimately, the gospel is about Christ. It's about God. It's about his great 
ministry and his great mercy and his great grace and righteousness and justice. And he invites us to know him. He makes us new. And so it's for us. Yes, the gospel is for you. Transforms us by his spirit. Makes us into a new child. Gives us an inheritance which will never uh, fade or spoil or be taken away. This is good news. It's good news to you. It's good news to me. It's good news to us. It's good news to the world. Christianity is about Christ. Right? It's not... Uh, let's make a new word up. It's not you, you anity. Is that a word? I don't know. It's, it, you're not at the center of Christianity. Right? Christ is. God is. And so when we say yes to Christ, that he makes us new, we say yes to his kingdom, we say yes to his mission which is to spread his goodness to your neighbor with the barking dogs. <laughs> it's to our neighbors and our neighborhoods, and it's to the nations. Okay. So as we think of Citizens of heaven, we think locally, but we understand globally what God is doing. Ministry and missions isn't something like, oh, we should probably do that. Right? It's like Jesus came, by the way. Right? He had it pretty good in heaven before the whole incarnation thing, right? He wasn't like, hey, I want to see what's going on down there. Maybe I should become a human. It was inconvenient, difficult, excruciating. The price was worth the reward. The reward is the glory of God among the nations. The reward is the family of Christ. The reward is that we can be with him forever. That is good news. Redemption from our trespass, our rebellion against our creator, our good creator. God redeems us and this is good news. So Paul looked at a circumstance and says, hey, 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 I want you to know that this circumstance actually served to advance the gospel. And he gives two reasons why. Number one, everyone who he was connected to found out that he was there because of Christ. And so he was in prison, and, and, and I'm sure the word went around, well, why is, Paul, why is this person here? Well, let me tell you why he's here. He believes that Jesus is the Messiah. What? What do you mean by that? Well, let me tell you. And Paul, now being chained, and more than likely, chained to a rotational guard of prisoners, he's like, all right, well, I got something to say, and we've got plenty of time, and you're not going anywhere, so let me tell you about Jesus. Every four hours, eight hours, 12 hours, I don't know how that worked, there was a new quote-unquote, captive audience, right? And he says, hey, you know what? This is amazing. Now that all of these soldiers, these gatekeepers, these jailers, that these ones, now the message, and more than likely he was in Rome, is penetrating through these people because of this circumstance. He says, this is good, friends. Right? And he says, second, the goal of those who put me in chains, and that more than likely it was the Judaizers, those who were against the message of Christ, okay? He says they were trying to intimidate the believers, that believers would look at Paul and like, 
eh, I don't want to go to jail. And so he went to jail because he proclaimed this message boldly. So therefore, mm, I'm going to kind of be on a down low about it a little bit because I don't want to go to jail, right? That's what they were hoping. But Paul said the exact opposite had happened. That because he was willing to stand up, regardless of what would happen to him personally, it gave power and bolted those around him and said, you know what, Paul did this? Why don't I stand up and stand out a little bit more? Because he is paying the price with his life and I surely want to do the same. And they stood up and spoke out. Right? That's powerful. People need to be encouraged to proclaim the message of Christ. I don't know if you have listened or watched a Christian biography or read for a while, read one in a while. Guess what? Do it. Talk to Jennifer right here. We have a library full of books. You're like, I don't know who to read about. I get a magazine, and I hope that you get it as well. It's called Voice of the Martyrs, if you're familiar with that. Modern day stories of what is happening right now. It comes out every month. Uh, every month, it comes out for free, and you can read about these stories of people who are standing up for Jesus in circumstances that are way difficult, way more difficult than yours and mine are. Right? Want to read about these pastors who have been imprisoned for years, and they proclaim the gospel even the more it helps me to be more bold. When I read about uh, an Indonesian lady who proclaimed the gospel door to door and people came against her and burned her with acid and she is now deformed and defigured but she is proclaiming the gospel, it helps me to stand up more. Right? Reading these stories help. Reading about the great biblical cloud of witnesses in Hebrews chapter 11 helps. Right? Going on mission trips, which we are going to go, and I've had the privilege to go to places, and listening to my brothers and sisters, how they are dedicated to get on motorcycles to travel throughout the world, throughout the night, and these little bitty motorcycles, right, to go out to these places that haven't heard with backpacks of projectors and dragging generators and just sleeping out in the sticks to gather some people and to talk about Jesus, and they do it because they love Christ and they love their nation. It motivates me. Right? You say, well, you know, I'm here. I got out of bed today. Praise God. Yeah, but grow up a little. Oh, I sacrificed for Jesus. I went to church two Sundays in a row. <sighs> it's good. It's progress. <laughs> How much does Jesus matter to you? This isn't a guilt trip. Hear my heart. God so loved the world that he gave. <laughs> and he calls us into an exciting adventure. He calls us into a body together so that we can encourage each other and spur one another on. Last week we talked about how it's so important that we can gather together and connect and encourage one another and do more together than we ever can do apart. <laughs> Jesus gave everything and gives us all things we have all things in Christ and what an honor it is to walk alongside of him it's not an obligation Christianity and following Christ should not be an obligation it should be an honor thank you that I can pray with my brothers and sisters thank you that we can gather in a place that the roof doesn't leak that much okay Thank you that I have the word of God in a language I understand. Do you understand how precious this is? 
People have died to give you this word. Died. Repeatedly. Generations of people. Preserve it. To print it. Translate it. We have it. There are places in the world. They don't have this. They don't have this. Help us to be captured by God's heart. Help God, help us to see our circumstances through his lens. It's important for us to be spurred on. I like reading about missionaries. I like meeting with these type of people. I like reading the Bible as well. Have you ever heard the, the story of Joseph? Right? Now, this is not Joseph and Mary Joseph, right? This is an interesting story. This is like Joseph, Old Testament, Genesis, Joseph. Right? Do you remember his circumstance? Right? Go ahead and read it. Not write the second, by the way, because it's kind of long. I'll summarize it for you. Joseph called my God. And a dream, my God. Shared it with the tribes, by the way. These young men, these 12 men, shared this dream. They got jealous. God gave them a dream. Guess what happened to Joseph? Right? Sold out by his brothers. <laughs> Difficult circumstance. Went into slavery. And in that slavery, he still committed to honor God. Believing that God is true to his word and he'll continue. But it was not easy. And yet as he was serving the Lord, being an honorable individual, he was lied about. And he had an opportunity to sleep with the lady, right? And he said, mm, I'm not going to do that, right? He wasn't pouting about his circumstance. By the way, Paul wasn't pouting about his circumstance, being chained in prison and like, oh, this really is horrible, right? Joseph's like, I'm going to do what's right regardless of where I am. And because of that, he got thrown in jail, right? <laughs> this is not the storyline that Joseph anticipated, right? And while in jail, he continued to minister to people. That is astounding to me. If I was there, I might have been Mr. Pouty Face, God, why did you do this to me? I don't like being here. I don't like this, these people, and this bread is horrible, right? I don't know. You probably never get that way about your circumstances. <laughs> and then he was ministering of evil, told them their dreams. This was his gift, using it. Came true. The people forgot about Joseph for two years. Right? Forgot about him. And just at the right time, boom, God changed it. And Joseph then, you can read this story, when he was reunited with his brothers, said, what you meant for evil, God meant for good. Not everybody's for you. Some people mean evil. For you. May we, as citizens of heaven, view our circumstances through the lens of God, will you redeem this? Will you use this? Will this circumstance serve advancing the gospel message? Think about your life. This will help you, right? I don't know what you're bemoaning about today, right? You're probably bemoaning about something. You feel like you're chained to something or somebody. Why is it that I'm stuck in a wheelchair all my life, right? I heard the collective groaning right here, right? You could bemoan. Why is it that I have, I'm left to take care of my parents and my brothers and sisters don't help? Why is it that I'm stuck in this career path and I feel chained to it and I can't get out? I'm not talking about sin here. That's a different bondage that we are to get free from. I'm just talking about circumstances. Like, why do I live in Rockford, Illinois? <laughs> <laughs> the great beauty of Rockford, our majestic mountains and our deep blue seas. 
Have you ever complained or bemoaned about your circumstances or your quote-unquote metaphorical chains? Living as a citizen of heaven, I'm trying to encourage you to think differently. God, will you use my circumstances to advance the gospel? Please, that's right. This helps, right? And I know it's hard. I'm not trying to say, oh, well, you know, it's not that hard. It's hard, right? It's hard. Paul's situation is hard. I'm not saying, oh, you know, pretend it's not hard. It's hard. But have the mindset of Christ. God, will you use this situation where I'm taking care of my parents or my place got raided or I'm um, having to do this and I'm stuck here. God, will you use this to advance the gospel from lost wallets to being stuck in jail? God, use this to advance the gospel. Right? That's a better mentality. <laughs> Even when you have your wallet with some cash in it, but you have some church cars, maybe they're like, hey. <laughs> maybe. <laughs> Think about this. This is why Paul wrote later on in Romans, and this is on the screen, and we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good. For those who are called according to his purpose, don't miss that. What's God's goal? We've talked about it here. Verse 29, one of my favorite verses in the Bible that helps me to frame my circumstances. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined for what? To be conformed into the image of his son. Why? In order that he might be firstborn among many brothers and sisters. He uses life's circumstances so that our character will be conformed to look like Jesus. You heard me talk about this, and so when we get to heaven, it's a big family reunion. It's like, hey, you look just like your older brother Jesus. Not that she needs to be a short Jewish dude, but you understand, not physically. Jesus loves people. Hey, you love people. Jesus gave himself. You give yourself for spreading God's word. So he uses that stuff. It helps me to understand. It should help you to understand. Circumstances are hard, right? I'm not, again, I'm not downplaying this, right? It's hard. Help me to have this mindset. You need supernatural power to do this. And this is why I said in the beginning, pray for this. Help me. Because I can't see it. It is dark. It is painful. It is lonely. I've been suffering for a very long time. Help me to have the mind of Christ in me. Because I can't. And I'm not asking you, you have to do that. I'm just asking you to cry one simple word, help. Help. God will help. Give me perspective. Give me understanding. So I'm asking us as a congregation. No, no. Let's make it stronger. The word is asking us as a congregation. God's word. That we would view our circumstances and pray that God, they would serve to advance the gospel. When you think this way, things change, and we typically do not reflectively think this way. This is why we transform our minds. Scripture helps us like this. Paul was helping them do that, and he's helping us. That's the first point. Second, I'm asking us to hold the preaching of Christ as most important. Paul continues as he unpacks how God is using these circumstances to spread his, the word of God, to advance the gospel. People are being encouraged. The word is going out because of, not despite of, his change, his circumstances. And he says, hey, let me also tell you this. This is verse 15 as we continue in this section. Now, he says, it is true that some preach... Christ out of envy and rivalry. 
but others out of good will. Now, the latter do so out of love, those preaching out of good will, knowing that I am put here for the defense of the gospel. Now, the former, those who preach Christ out of envy and rivalry, do so out of selfish ambition, not sincerely, supposing that they can stir up trouble for me while I'm in chains. But he says, hmm, what does it matter? The important thing is that in every way, whether from false motives or true motives, Christ is preached. The important thing, the most important thing, that Christ is preached. And because of this, I rejoice. Paul wasn't rejoicing because of the, the means, so to speak. He was rejoicing because of the ends that Christ was preached. He says, you know, it doesn't matter necessarily what happens to me. The most important thing is that Christ is preached. Now again, this is an incredible perspective. This is a supernatural one. This again is right and good for us as citizens of heaven to think this way. The most important thing is not our circumstances. The most important thing is not your condition. The most important thing is that Christ is preached. Right? And Paul's saying, hey, you know what? That the message of the gospel was not always being told with good motivation, right? As people were telling the story of Paul, right, they weren't telling it because they loved the gospel. They were telling it because they were jealous of his message or that his movement was growing. More than likely, this was the Jewish church, those who did not believe in Jesus as the Messiah. So they were saying to others, hey, we put Paul in prison. You know why he's in prison? He believes Jesus was the Messiah. He believes that he is the resurrection and the life. He believes that Jesus died for the sins of the world. Can you believe that? Right? What a fool. Right? People, by the way, will actually do that today if they understand the message of the gospel and they understand what you're about. I'm building relationships, and I hopefully you are as well, intentional relationships of people who do not know the gospel, and some of those who do, they're opposed to it, right? I want them to know what the Bible says and what I believe so that they can talk about it to other people. Can you believe that, dude? Right? He says, you know what? In sowing of the seeds... What's most important is that the gospel message, who Christ is, gets out, regardless of the motivation of the individual. Right? This is evangelism. This is gospel sowing. There's a difference between gospel sowing and, by the way, gospel growing. Right? <laughs> you want your pastor to believe the gospel himself or herself. Right? You want a place in which there is love and respect so that we can grow. You would not grow in or be encouraged to grow in Christ in a non-Messiah Jewish community or in a Muslim community. You will not be encouraged to grow that. It's a growing, but a sowing is different. And Paul is saying, hey, listen, what's most important is that the message of Christ is being preached for the gospel is the power of God for the salvation of everyone who believes, regardless, by the way, of the motivation of the individual who's sharing the message. So this informs a couple things to me in my mind. Number one, when we do missions and outreach, is it good to provide food for starving people? It's not a trick question. Yeah. Yeah. Like, I don't know. Jesus, is that the answer? It, it, it is. Is it good? Sure. Absolutely it's good. Right? Is it good to clothe those who need clothing? Yeah. Right? Is it good to visit people in jail? Yeah. Dave, where do you get this? Um, let's see, Matthew chapter 25, Jesus talks about doing these things, right? 
it's good to do. Right? However, if we don't tell people about Jesus, we've missed what's most important. Amen. Hear me. The difference between humanitarian aid and Christian aid is Jesus. Is Christian aid a thing? I don't know. Gospel Christian? Christians bringing aid is the reason why we do it, and most importantly, the message of Jesus, right? So I want to be a part of missions work that hits the main point, which is declaring who Jesus is. We do these things, open doors, fish and bread, so that the gospel is preached. Right? If the end result is people are closed, that's a good thing, but it's a temporal thing. People can wear really nice clothes and still end up in hell away from Christ for eternity. Looking fine, but not in a good place. The logic says that use these things for a greater good. Feed people so that you can tell them about Christ. Right? Clothe people so that you can tell them about Christ. Right? So when we do missions work, we should be doing some of these things as means to a message. Message is most important, right? So we think about these things. By the way, in preaching, okay, which I participate in pretty regular, right? What's the, what's the point of preaching? That we're moral. No. That we discipline our kids better. That's not the main point. That our marriages is better. Not that these things are bad. That we understand every jot and tittle about the end times. Right? The point of preaching is the message of Christ. The gospel. Paul highlighted this in all... Have you read his letters? Talking about Christ and Christ and Christ. These things can be included, but these are, these are okay. But the main point is Christ. <laughs> Here to... In encourage you and remind you of things that you believe and that the message of who Jesus Christ is central to our church. The church points to the cross, which is the point, right? And we can get all off into other areas and we come back and we've distanced ourselves from Christ because we're so fixated on where Noah's ark landed. It's okay, but Christ's the point. Right? Right? If you get in these arguments with people who want to argue stuff, you can have conversations, but the most thing is, hey, where are you at with Jesus, Jack? Right? Where are you at? Christ is central. That's the message, and Paul recognizes, right? Hey, whether from false mo motives or true, the important thing is that Christ is preached regardless of my circumstances in this I rejoice so the communicating the message of Christ is the most important must be the primary focus of our mission okay. as a Christian your most important priority is not to have enough money in your retirement or I want to have more freedom when I'm 65 I hope you have more freedom when you're 65 so you can go on missions trips. I hope you have an eternal perspective. You're not taking all your stuff with you. My stuff is important. Not really. Okay. Done plenty of U-Hauls. I've never seen a hearse with a tra trailer hitch pulling a U-Haul doesn't happen mind of Christ what's most important viewing your circumstances as opportunity to advance the gospel think this way 
viewing your life as through the lens of how can the message of Christ go forward? This is thinking like citizens of heaven. This is what empowers saints who sacrifice. By the way, you're called a saint as well. People who we look up to to sacrifice and to go and to let go and to communicate with great joy what they found is much better than temporal circumstance. God help us to be people like this. And this church has taken this position over the decades. Right now I'm going to ask Bob Carlson to come up. He's going to tell us a story. True account, something that some of you guys know and some of you don't know. As an illustration of people who have gone before us. As an illustration of what God is doing for us. As an illustration as to what may be becoming in the future. So thank you, Bob, for communicating these things to us. It's my pleasure to share with you this morning a, a real God story that uh, is going on within Cross Point Church. It's a story that started a long time ago, and I'll give you some details of it. But it's a story that started many years ago. It's a story that's going on right now for such a time as this. And it's a story that's going to continue for generations as long as the Lord uh, blesses this effort. And um, it's, it's one that we all are involved in. And uh, there are many people, as I mentioned some things, that that will resonate with, you've been involved with, and, uh, and there are others that it's fairly new. And I, we're, we're doing this because it's a direct example of what uh, Paul is talking about in Philippians, and it's what Pastor Dave was sharing this morning. Um, and I'll start by saying Crosspoint is um, a very young church. It's less than five years old. But this story, uh, and it, it merged back in 1919 with three different Christian churches, a uh, very unusual experience that uh, we, are, we are being blessed with right now, and that in itself is another story uh, for another day. But uh, the oldest of these three groups was called Temple Baptist Church, and it had a different name back in 1880, um, many Swedish, uh, really poor Swedish immigrants who were Christians in their country came and resettled in Rockford, Illinois and established a church. And in the archives of this church, as we uh, discovered it several years ago, uh, in 1880, the very year that they organized, uh, they gathered the money that they could and in cooperation with other churches around the country, sent uh, really this association's first missionary abroad to the British colony of Burma, the first missionary that, that went there uh, by, by this Swedish association. A couple years later, they sent their second missionary again to the British colony of Burma. 141 years later, around 2011, um, as uh, the, the church that by then had moved uh, to this location uh, was graying or balding and, uh, and was getting much fewer and there might have been some questions within a few years whether it would uh, keep the doors open. Uh, at that time in 2011, suddenly a group of Burmese refugees who, and the country is now called Myanmar, who had resettled in Rockford after experiencing very difficult experiences in their home country, as well as the host country maybe of Malaysia or Thailand or India, who had settled in Rockford, suddenly showed up in the pews of Temple Baptist Church. We immediately fell in love together with each other. We did life together. And um, we partnered in the gospel uh, to continue to share and proclaim the gospel in the central part of the city. Uh, and then those two groups, uh, back in 2019, merged with another younger, more dynamic, uh, really a, I would call it a Gen X church, uh, with a pastor with a rather unusual name, Spooner. We, we, we merged in 2019, and we are being blessed in experiencing uh, the results of that merger uh, today. It's an amazing story of how God has taken 
144 years of very different experiences for many of our people from 8,000 miles away in the jungles of Burma brought this group together to proclaim the gospel and experience the goodness of, of his providence uh, for his purposes. And so um, I'd like to dig a little deeper, though, in a couple, a couple of these issues to really share what really excites me. And, and it's the experience of a couple individuals who served as leaders in the Burmese community. And as we merged together and as we grew together, these two individuals proved the importance of, of spiritual maturity and strong leadership uh, devoted to the cause of Christ, even at their, even at their own ex expense and, and benefit. And um, so Christian leadership is important. I know Dave has described us, we're all leaders in a certain way, but these two individuals, I think, uh, deserve to be honored and, and uh, their experience, again, exempli uh, exemplifies what Paul um, exemplified. Individual response is important in bad circumstances. And I, I just, uh, maybe a footnote is this church is blessed with a lot of really great leaders. And I hope we appreciate that. <laughs> and, I, and I hope we continually pray for our leaders because if a church is on track with God's purposes, those leaders are targets uh, of our enemy. And so please uh, continue to pray for, for all of our leaders. But the two individuals, first is Pastor Ki Tang, Many of you have known him, work, worked with him. Uh, he has been the leader of our, our Burmese congregation since 2011. Uh, he and his family of six left a very difficult experience in, in his own home country of Myanmar, then went to Malaysia for a good number of years, and then resettled in Rockford to continue his ministry uh, with his growing, growing church. Um, one of the stories about him is, I don't know, if many of you knew that he used to live in the White House that uh, is currently um, the, the ministry site of Life Decisions, but he lived there after he was resettled in a, in a pretty small and uh, dingy apartment. Um, one of the ladies in our church suggested that that, church, that, that house could be better used as uh, a location for our Burmese pastor. The reason I'm mentioning this is one day uh, while we were driving in the car after he was living there for a while, he told me about his dream. When he was a child at age seven, his father was a Christian pastor in Burma. He woke up and told his father that God had given him a dream. Now they grow up in log, single uh, room log huts in the jungles of Burma, but the Lord had given this seven-year-old boy a dream that one day he was going to live in a white house with many rooms. At age seven, now he's uh, very close to 40 when he's telling me the story. And then after he married Pam from the same village, she woke up one day and said, Key, I've had a weird dream. Um, we're going to live in a white house with many rooms on a very busy street with, with a bunch of white people driving cars <laughs> back and forth. <laughs> um, since he has stayed with us, he has made three overseas trips to go back to Myanmar and Kenya and India uh, to serve the Lord, uh, to share the gospel, to encourage pastors. And one of the, um, the critical events for uh, his testimony with us is that a little over a year ago, our Burmese congregation split. Uh, there were leaders in that congregation that felt that they should leave Cross Point even after our merger and should form their own church. Pastor Key agonized over this. Uh, he had ministered to these people for years, uh, had close personal relationships with them. The issue was, what is Pastor Key going to do? And one day in uh, Pastor Dave's office, Key mentioned, God has told me that I am to keep my ministry here, even if nobody comes with me, uh, to continue to serve the Lord at Crosspoint. Two-thirds of the people left, 
Pastor Key and the other third stayed. They are now the core of, of our uh, current uh, Burmese community. We have moved forward with partnering, with working together, with, with uh, far greater cooperation in our ministries. We have benefited by his courage despite uh, the criticism and uh, the very difficult experience he went through. The second individual is uh, another one that I, th I think you may know because he's been up here. He's, he's an elder in, in the, uh, the Burmese leadership, Robinson, key leader, resettled in 2019, uh, now has a family of six, um, a long stint uh, after he left uh, Myanmar in Malaysia. Um, referring to the split that took place in the Burmese community, Robinson and Esther, his wife, agonized over what was happening within their own core of friends and people they had ministered with and for. They were heartbroken, and he committed for days fasting and praying about what he and his family should do. Um, one day, he told me that God had given him a vision. And in that vision, God had told him, you are to keep your family and you are to stay at Cross Point Church, and you will be a key person in rebuilding the Burmese community within this church and to cooperate uh, with the entire church uh, for the cause of Christ. Um, he was the one that discovered a brand new international effort called Welcome Corps. He was the one that brought it forward and proposed to leadership that Crosspoint should be doing this. Welcome Corps is a brand new effort that allows private groups like churches to not uh, just sponsor uh, refugees who come here, maybe the next one who can get off the plane. They're generally waiting about 15 years in UN camps uh, to come here. But Welcome Corps also allows you to, if you know a refugee, to actually sponsor that refugee, even if they haven't been, even if they're not first in line. Crosspoint has uh, initiated involvement with this. We have three teams that are very close to submitting applications. Um, we have identified, as of last week, we've identified 59 relatives of our 10 families who are waiting as refugees and want to come here. <clears throat> uh, very shortly, we'll be making application to bring the first 30 people uh, to resettle and to reunite with their family members. Okay, in conclusion, we have a provident God in all the circumstances of life. He will accomplish his purpose uh, to proclaim the gospel and to draw people to himself. We have a great privilege to be involved corporately and individually. This is just one of the stories that I think are going on here at Cross Point. And um, one of the things I love about this, and I'm gonna ask the guys, oh, there it is. Because I've been up there a long time. You've probably been thinking, what is that? Well, I wanted to conclude with this. Hundred and forty four years ago, some um, some relatively poor uh, immigrants to Rockford sent money uh, to evangelize people in the jungles of Burma hundred and forty four years ago. Last month, descendants from that effort, who are now members of the Cross Point Church, sent two hundred dollars back to Myanmar that uh, after it went through uh, the channels, that $200 bought a solar power system for a Christian church in the middle of the jungles of Burma. And there, to me, I mean, that is so dramatic of the, of the um, totality of God's plan, the completeness, the wholeness of it, and that we have the, the uh, privilege to be a part of. I will close with, with um, a verse that Pastor Michael read yesterday at the men's breakfast uh, out of 1 Peter 1. 
and it just kind of jumped off the page when I looked at it. And uh, Peter is writing to Christ followers, and he refers to them as who have been chosen according to the foreknowledge of God the Father through the sanctifying work of the Spirit to be obedient to Christ Jesus. And um, I'm looking forward to the story continuing, all the others, and uh, thank you for listening because I think uh, it's um, the one that's most exciting to me at the moment. Thank you. If you would, yeah, I'd just dip here. It's okay. Yeah. Oh, um, <laughs> I asked Bob to stay, but Bob wants to leave, so that's fine. <laughs> uh, uh, what to say here? <clears throat> Your life matters. <laughs> Your giving matters. What we read about here is just not some dead text. These things are happening today. Right? We have opportunity to partner in the gospel. We have opportunity to bring his message to the nations and to the neighborhood. We can do this. Sacrifice of, of poor immigrants that said, you know what? It's not about building a great church. It's about reaching the nations. We're going to give what we can. 140 years later, God's doing this, and he's redoing it. Situation, war in Myanmar, horrible. War in other places, horrible. But these people were, were, were then pressed down and, and spread to different places, and they heard the gospel, and now they have opportunity to hear the gospel. There's people in Rockford that know Jesus because of a war in Myanmar. And there's people in Myanmar that heard the gospel because of poor Swedish immigrants that said, God cares about the nations of the world. Let us join ourselves to this great work can't imagine in heaven thinking, oh, I wish I wouldn't have given so much to missions. I'm, I'm just telling you. I'm not trying to manipulate you. I can't imagine saying, oh, you know what? I wish I wouldn't have given that money to the church, or I wish I wouldn't have gone on that trip. I can't imagine that. It's going to be like God, thank you for allowing me to do this. And I do that. I wish I would have done this more. We have breath in our lungs. We have time on this side of eternity. We're gonna, it's all going to be made new. But let us do the most that we can now. I don't know what that looks like for you. Ask Christ. <laughs> Ask him. What would you have me to do? But more importantly, God, give me your heart, give me your mind, help me to know what to do. That's probably better. Right? How does your circumstances help to advance the gospel? Think this way. Value hold to the message of Christ as the most important thing. Okay. So I'm going to pray for us. It is... 11.35 already, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to punt here. I'm going to make a call an audible. I'm going to pray for us, and then I'm going to give you a benediction. And then if you have children in the nursery, get your kids. Okay. <laughs> and if you need some time to think about this, hey, think about it. Come here and pray. People praying there, we're going we're gonna, to we'll pray. Right? Think. So let's pray. God, I do believe that you met with us today. May ministry and missions not be for others, may it be for us, each of us. God, will you capture our heart with what captures yours? Help us to see beyond the limits of our circumstances into the greater story. Will you do 
that. In us, will you fan the flame? In us, will you renew the hope, God? Open our eyes to the bigger picture. Help us to think as a citizen of heaven and follow with those implications. God, thank you for the history of these combined churches. God, grateful. Thank you for the history of people like Paul who gladly endured prison so that the gospel will be preached. And that message came even to us. Thank you for this baton passing, torch bearing from one generation to the next. And God, thank you that it's our turn with the light. And God, may we lift it high. God, do a miracle with with us. God, make us like stupid, generous, God. Make us loving people who are delighted to make you known. To build your body for your namesake. Give us that heart, God, and only you can do that. We thank you that this spirit continues to this day. Speak to us individually, God, as you're speaking to us corporately. And now may God's grace abound to you, so that having all sufficiency in all things at all times, that you may abound in every good work. Jesus, we give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen.